Please. Welcome. Good morning. Thanks for bearing with us uh, for a few extra moments while we work through some technical uh, details. Uh, and thanks for joining us to observe the last few days of winter. Um, it's, it's really exciting. Um, I've, uh, and particularly yesterday, uh, seeing everybody showing such respect for the earth and for the environment by wearing green. I thought that was great. <laughs> so welcome um, and thanks for joining us here on campus uh, for this uh, another special and unique Saturday morning physics event. I'm uh, Tim Chupp and one of the organizers of Saturday Morning Physics together with Professor Roy Clark and Carol Raybook, Monica Wood and her staff. And uh, that takes a lot to put these on. Um, last we checked, if you were here last week, who was here last week? Okay, we had a really great and uh, exciting and fun presentation from the Demo Lab. Uh, last check, there were over 5,000, nearly 6,000 uh, YouTube views uh, of the video for that. So, physics goes boom. Uh, seems to have attracted quite a number of viewers. Today's unique event uh, will be presented by Gina Gibson, uh, an artist inspired by science, and Bjorn Penning, a scientist inspired in part uh, by art. They're both professors, Gina at Black Hills State University in South Dakota and Bjorn here at the University of Michigan. Uh, Gina is an internationally recognized artist and a professor of graphic design. She grew up in North Carolina and she studied at uh, North Carolina Pembroke and Greensboro and completed her Master of Fine Arts degree in 2006. And since 2008, she has been at Black Hills State and she'll tell us much more about her journey uh, in a few moments. Uh, in 2019, she became the first artist in residence at the Sanford Underground Research Facility and um, has been widely recognized. She's had many shows, including at Fermilab uh, and at the University of Michigan Museum of Natural History, which opened yesterday and will be on display there uh, in their experimental gallery until next January. So don't uh, make sure you get a chance to see that. Professor Bjorn Penning is from uh, Schwabia, that's near the Black Forest in Germany, and he did his undergrad work at Freiburg uh, locally and uh, received his uh, PhD in 2009. He came to Michigan in 2020, but before that he was on the faculty at the universities of Bristol and Brandeis University. And he's currently working on uh, direct dark matter searches, as he will tell us. Uh, but before that, he was what's called a collider physicist, at working at the highest energies uh, at CERN and at Fermilab. And uh, one of the experiments and things that he worked on was the first uh, search for dark matter at the Large Hadron Collider. So their joint presentation is called Unearth. Uh, that's the same name as Gina's exhibit at the Natural History Museum. Thanks very much for joining us. We're really looking forward to this, and Bjorn, take it away. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. So, good morning. So, can, this is, yeah, you hear me, right? You can hear me well in the back? Okay, let's do this a bit higher. Is it okay now? Okay, sounds, I can hear myself. Good, so I'm talking, I'm, I will present you briefly the motivation for our research and what dark matter is for about 20 minutes, including some demonstrations. No, let's, let's change mics. I'm pretty sure mine works. Yeah. <laughs> good, well, now we have a mandatory technical glitch out of the way, so this is good. Um, so I'm going to present you uh, quickly what is dark matter and how do we search for it and how does this connect to our, um, to our exhibition that you're welcome to view, of course, after uh, our uh, Saturday morning physics talk. So how do we try to unearth dark matter? First, what is dark matter? Well, how do we know what's in the universe? We know everything is made out of four elements, right? Earth, water, wind, and fire. At least this was a very early model we had. And then over the millennia, philosophers, natural philosophers, and then they became alchemists and scientists, developed a much more detailed model until in 
throughout the last 100 years about, we really discovered the structure of matter, and then even went into the structure of matter, and went even further in, and were able to resolve what's within nuclei, within protons and neutrons. And this was just in 2012, just about 10 years ago, that with the uh, fantastic discovery of the Higgs boson, we had this great breakthrough, and with what we call the standard model of matter, or the, just the standard model, we can describe all matter on all types of energy you're familiar with or you may ever have heard of. And this uh, standard model is incredibly accurate. <laughs> it's incredibly accurate. And we can calculate things to a huge precision. So are we done? Well, unfortunately, at about the same time scale, we also learned that all of the thousands, thousands of years of work understanding the universe is really just describing 5% of the matter energy content of the universe. Dark matter is five times as much in the universe than regular matter, and three quarters of the universe is dark energy. And I have to say, it is absolutely certain that those entities exist. Absolutely certain. But we don't know what they are. So I always say, there's a high job safety, job guarantee as a scientist because we keep discovering new things. Okay, how do we know what is dark matter? There is, that dark matter exists. There's a very large body of evidence, but I'm going to describe only one example. If you're looking at a, at a galaxy and the movement of a galaxy, then of course you can use Newton, Newton's theory of gravity, and describe its movements. And these movements predicts that the radial velocity the speed with which stars rotate around the galactic center should drop as you go further and further out. Do you see this here? But the actual observations already done based on galaxy clusters 100 years ago by Zwicky and then really confirmed and done on galaxies in the 1960s by Vera Rubin showed that this is not the case. They're dropping much, much later and what we actually can observe in starlight, but also in other types of observations, uh, we, are, we have a huge disc discrepancy. It is as if all the galaxies are like swimming in this huge halo of dark matter. And this dark matter, and this is why we call it matter, is pulling the stars along. So if we see in the night sky a galaxy, what actually this gal galaxy would look like is like this, surrounded by this enormous dark matter halo. Now you might ask yourself, why, why, would, it, why would dark matter matter? The, the fact is that it's a hugely successful theory. We have many, many, uh, we have a huge body of evidence from the early universe. For example, this is, if, if, if you a bit know about cosmology, this is how the, the Big Bang looks like for us. We're not able to see the Big Bang, but we're, seeing, we're able to see something called the cosmic microwave background, which is when the universe became transparent. And there are these little ripples in, and these little ripples then form gravity welds that attracted this early cloud of hydrogen. And today we can calculate how the elements formed, early elements have formed, biogenesis, leptogenesis. Then in early stars formed, burned out, exploded, formed early galaxies, and the entire galactic web formed along the patterns early on imprinted in the universe by dark matter. So it's truly important for our existence in the universe as we know it. And we can, with it, explain 13 billion years of cosmic history. So if dark matter is so important, how come we haven't seen it and how much there is? And as, as usual with astronomy and physics and astrophysics is, it's not easy, right? So, because dark matter matters on these huge scales, but on Earth, given the density of dark matter that we can approximately measure from these observations, we just expect about one kilogram of dark matter, less than the donuts we had here in this morning, right? So, it's, uh, 
it's very hard to find. And on top of that, dark matter, similar to a neutrino, is very weakly interacting, meaning we could be right now, we are most likely we're being passed through by dark matter particle as we speak, just as we are being passed through by millions of neutrinos, yet only one in an astro astronomically large number will actually interact. And these interactions of dark matter create tiny, tiny energy signatures. Very, very difficult to, to detect. And in the entire solar system, you would not have more dark matter than, for example, a small moon. So it's really hard. Why is it still important? Because most space in space, that's what we call it space, is empty. And so on galactic scales, filling all the space between the stars, between the planets, between the galaxies, dark matter is then really dominating, just as gravity dominates when you're getting away from Earth, but here on Earth, of course, we do not really feel the gravitational pull of the building compared to the electromagnetic repulsion of the ground pushing against me. Okay, so this is what we know about dark matter. It's very important. It will interact very, very rarely. So if you're building large detectors, we expect only a handful of events per year. So it's what we call a rare event search. Yet at the same time, we have to create detectors that are able to find the, even the faintest energies. And this is a conundrum, this is a problem we have to solve. Because if we have detectors that can essentially react to any type of radiation, they will be very quickly overwhelmed and you have trillions of background events to find one or two dark matter events. How do we solve that? And now something went off here. Um, Okay, just look at the right and left one. I don't know why <laughs> we have our second technical quiz. So we have to build the most sensitive detectors free of any interference. So for this, what is a big source of background? Cosmic rays. Cosmic rays are permanently raining down on us from outer space. And you might know it as the aurea borealis, which are cosmic rays being trapped and in the magnetic field of Earth being sort of led to, to, the, um, uh, to the poles. What we have here is a muon telescope. And if I switch this on, it's actually already on, and I shouldn't touch it because it's high voltage. What you hear now are cosmic muons. Muons produced in the upper atmosphere by cosmic rays. Going through here, we see here two pulses. These are two what we call scintillator panels, top and bottom. And when two of them are in coincidence within the same time window, given approximately by the speed of light, which is a few nanoseconds in between, we get a signal. And these cosmic muons are just one of many components, but actually a very dangerous component for the search for dark matter. And as you can imagine, even in this very small, fairly small, few tens of square centimeter area, if we let this run for 24 hours, 365 days, we're getting many, many events. And then you're looking for dark matter hidden in all of this. It's going to be very hard. So how do we get, how do we get away from that? By going deep. We go one mile deep. And being one mile underground, we're filtering out all of these cosmic rays. And what we have left over is only one in 10 million cosmic muons will, make, will be able to pass through the, uh, through the mantle of the Earth to a depth of one mile where we built our experiment. And this experiment is built at the so-called Sanford Underground Research Lab. Professor Gibson will talk a little bit more about this, but it's one of my favorite places on Earth. It's in the beautiful Black Hills. And now I have, always have to ask the question, this makes me feel a bit old. Who of you knows the movie Dancing with Wolves? Yep. It's basically back there where it has filmed at least part of that movie in Spearfish Canyon. It's like really beautiful. It's in an absolute stunning place, but it's also stunning science. The cavern where we're building the experiment is the so-called Ray Davis Cavern, Nobel Prize 2001, who in the 1960s discovered two things, first of all, 
neutrinos from the sun, but there are also not enough neutrinos from the sun. And this is a huge breakthrough, which until today motivates some of the biggest experiments we are building also in that place, because we know this is not being explained by the solar model of physics. And if you go down there, the, Gina will talk more about it, but you see, you see me here um, without beard, you really don the gear of a miner, you go through this mine, it's not a production mine, but they're still doing ex excavations and they have to maintain it. And it's a very interesting place and a true science gem with a lot of interesting science being done. Now, now we are far away from the interference of cosmic rays. We still have to deal with radioactivity because, as you know, there's radioactivity in the ground, there's radioactivity everywhere. So we have to build these detectors as clean and sensitive as possible. And even if we're away from cosmic rays, and this Geiger counter, for example, this is too, really too small to... to um, uh, need to get rid of it. So, this is too small to detect cosmic rays, but regular radioactivity. And I've switched this on, and I hope you can hear this. We have radioactivity everywhere. This is one of the old-timey watches, you know, with the, with the glowing uh, uh, hands. Remember when you were a kid and you had these watches glowing at dark? There was a reason for that. <laughs> Smoke detectors, they're using an uh, americium source, an alpha Radiator, not dangerous for you. Oh, it's dangerous if you swallow it, but so don't swallow it, but not dangerous. It's kind of even penetrate your skin. Smoke detector. Right? Or this is just like a gaslight mantle. So radioactivity is everywhere. In fact, if I go away from those objects, you still hear a tick, right? Once in a while. Radioactivity. Radioactivity is unavoidable. When I said we can calculate these days with great precision how everything came into existence, we also know essentially nothing heavier than, than lithium beryllium was created in the Big Bang. Everything heavier has been baked in suns and up to iron, and everything heavier than iron, for example, here my, my my wedding ring, gold, has even been baked in more cataclysmic, cosmic uh, events like neutron star mergers. So, of course, if you bake gold in, in, the, in, in, in an event, it creates a black hole, quite literally. Or if you make iron in fusion of the sun, of course, there's trace reactivity. And this is our challenge, to get rid of this trace reactivity in the material we're building a detector of and in the remaining surrounding rock. And so when we build this detector, we need to avoid all types of contamination and we screen means measure reactivity of all components down to the screws, down to the gravel on the ground and take them into account and try to shield from them. And to give you an idea how clean we build these detectors, we built this all in a clean room. The a banana, due to potassium, has about 15 becquerel. So bananas are radioactive, but very weak. I couldn't measure them with the standard Geiger counter. The target activity in our main dark matter target that we achieve is two micro becquerel. To put this in a very important scientific unit, the banana equivalent, the reactivity corresponds to one over three quarter of a millionth bananas. So we are cleaner than one over almost a million bananas in terms of reactivity. This experiment and also a competitor slash colleague experiment in, in Italy are, as, we, as, as far as we know, the most radio pure objects uh, on Earth, or to put it this way, in the known universe, but we really don't know so much about uh, beyond Earth. <laughs> then, of course, we still have radioactivity sometimes happening in the detector decays, and of course from the outside, as I mentioned also, while we're filtering out te one in ten, and like 10 million muons per muon that make it down there, occasionally they make it through. So there's the outer detector, uh, which then 
shields further from external radiation, is able to catch internal radiation we might have missed and to veto that. I'll show you how this actually looks like. This is on the, here on the left, the assembled TPC. TPC stands for Time Projection Chamber. Sounds very Doctor Who-like. It's pretty much Doctor Who-like. It's like a detector which is able to measure faintest energies. In the top right and the middle right, we have the PMTs, photomultiplier tubes, big arrays of photomultiplier tubes that are built, that can detect a single quanta, right? A single quantum of energy. And then we have a very high, uh, vol high voltage grids, etc. And you see it's quite beautiful because we have this high reflectivity, this high symmetry, this very good understanding. And form follows functions results in beautiful detectors. We built this all under extreme clean room conditions. Then, three years ago, we brought it underground. We put it into a cake, uh, in, a, in a case with perch. Here it's dangling, the work of years, of many people is dangling on a one mile drop. And in fact, the mine is deeper than a mile and they allowed it to flood to a certain level because, well, you don't need the further one. So if this would have like ripped off, would have just fallen past by our, 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 our drift and then splashed into the water would be done. Then we pull it out here and then we pull it into the Davis cavern. You see here what gives the actual dimension of how big we can build it. It's the maximum size we can bring something in there. This is the insertion of the TPC into the cryostat in the, in the water tank. The outer detector is all filled with water and a special fluid used to detect particles uh, now. And this is the outer detector. This here has been all built by uh, U-Michigan and also the, the, the tanks you see here by uh, UC Santa Barbara, which is, if you follow the news when we released our first assault, was quite uh, visible in the media. So, uh, yeah, I think it looks very beautiful. I spent a lot of time building this. I like it. <laughs> okay. So how do we now look for dark matter? And I'm not going too much into detail, but any particle entering will create two types of signal. One will be a light signal and one will be ionization signal. And the idea is similar like a so-called cloud chamber. So if we could switch to the cloud chamber, please. What we have here behind Gina is a cloud chamber. When the, and we have here a thoriated rock, so it's an alpha emitter, low pressure, vapor, alcohol vapor, and you see when, when particles pass through the vapor, they leave traces, and, this, and you will notice different type of traces if you watch long enough. You have these big, straight ones, these are alphas, these are nuclei, helium nuclei essentially, alpha radiation. And then you have the more curved one and more faint one, more whispers, these are betas, so electrons, or sometimes you're lucky you see something y, like, like a Y coming out of nowhere that's actually an electron positron, antimatter that creates. And similarly, as like the shape and how thick they are or how faint they are tells us is this a nuclear or electronic type of interaction, we can do this in our detector. So if you can go back, please. Um, of course, then... Understanding all of this takes a lot of effort by many very dedicated grad students, postdocs, and undergrad researchers, because the actual waveforms don't look as beautiful as here, but they are very wiggly and very, you know, and we record every single event. We don't do it digitized, later we digitize it, but we really have a resolution of a few nanoseconds. When we actually run it, it looks like this. We have the outer detector and the inner detector, and we see here all the flashes are light that we detect. We have many, many pulses, and then we have to sift through them. We have to develop energy corrections, calibration selections to really get the dark matter out of there, which we can do very, very well, but I will not go through all of the detail. So, the result, this is the only really hard plot I'm hoping to show you, is what we released last summer. This is what we call the sensitivity of our experiment, which after 60 days of running already surpassed, so lower is better, all previous experiments, with only 60 days. We see here incredibly small numbers, and this is the potential mass of dark matter in terms of a unit that corresponds to the mass of a proton. 
And we see here an order of 10 to the power of minus 47, 48 for our dark matter exclusion. To give you an idea, if, if I take a hydrogen atom and blow it up to the size of, dark uh, of the sun, then actually the, um, we would be able, if, if a hydrogen atom would be the size of the sun, then we would be able to see an invisible hydrogen atom with our detector but we haven't discovered it yet. So let me come to an end. I take too much time, sorry for that. So with only 6% of the data, we have had the strongest results. I hope with the remaining 94% we are planning to take, we will find dark matter. I hope. I don't know, unfortunately. But being an observatory, we can also see, uh, do a lot of other measurements. We can connect to supernova physics, to multi-messenger astronomy, to, to, to uh, how, Big Bang, evolution of the universe, rare elements, etc. all of those. So let me just quickly thank to all of the many students and postdocs who worked on this. There's all you Michigan personnel you see up there, including here, Chami is here, so he is also working this very hard. And yeah, let's move on to the art. Thank you very much. Good morning. First, I'd like to thank Bjorn for getting me out here and to the department and for this opportunity. I feel like I need to give a little, <clears throat> excuse me, a little more background. You know some things about me already, uh, but you should know that I collect things. You'll probably be able to tell that once you go to the art exhibition. Uh, I collect not only objects, but also ideas. For context, Black Hills State, where I teach, and also the Sanford Lab are located in the Black Hills, like mentioned, but just in case you don't know where that's at, there it is, the red circle. But I think it's easier if we go back just a touch, and I talk about why do I make art. You know, some people aren't used to artists, so maybe I can give you a little context for that as well. For me, it's curiosity, a lot of curiosity. It gives meaning, and it also gives me a purpose. And I'll start by talking about a series that I did about 15 years ago, maybe a little less. I, by trade, I do painting, drawing, all kinds of stuff as an undergrad. I started doing digital media as well. And I did a lot of work about my mother, who was sick for about 12 years. And she passed away in 2008, and I struggled to make art. Now, there were multiple reasons I struggled to make art. I struggled to make art because I had moved from my home in North Carolina to a home in the Black Hills of South Dakota for my first tenure-track job, which you might have caught on I stayed at. Um, so the first art exhibition that I had was kind of a struggle to put together because I just didn't know how to make. It's almost like I lost visual language. Um, I needed to kind of turn into something else. And I started to simplify images, and suddenly all I could come up with was a symbol set. So symbols seem simple enough, I could grab onto them, they can mean something to me. The door, I like doorways and passageways. It kind of speaks of hope or moving into another phase. A chair could either mean rest or it can mean sitting still and not moving. I like things to have sometimes two meanings that are opposite, kind of exist there. And then the ladder, ladders have been in my work for years. Um, it's kind of like reaching for something. It's kind of a symbol, personally, for reaching. And even though I'm a digital artist, I also do found object art. And about eight years ago or so, I made a series that was completely found objects, like literally walking around in the woods, picking up a stick. Here's a rock. It's broken. I kind of like broken rocks. I really love them, actually. Um, thrift store finds. Basically, if you have junk that you're not sure, Maybe an artist can use it. Um, it's very possible. And I also do what I call eye candy, things that I just think are pretty. Uh, I, when I travel, I'm always taking pictures with the thought of I might turn it into something. So on, an, on a trip to Japan, I ended up turning those images into an exhibition, <clears throat> which gave me an opportunity to think about architectural, architecture differently, uh, pattern. I love pattern. I love color. 
And then in 2013, I had an opportunity that I almost didn't take. I like to mention that because sometimes we don't know that we're supposed to take an opportunity. I was invited to the Sanford Underground Research Facility to be a part of a group art, group art exhibition of South Dakota artists. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I, that's 35 minutes up the hill. I'm in the middle of teaching this class. I mean, I had every excuse. And it was right before tenure, so I was crazy. Um, and one of my faculty or one of my colleagues said, you have to go underground. Nobody gets to go underground. I said, OK. It didn't sound that appealing, if I'm honest, to go a mile underground. And so I reluctantly drove up the hill and went to the Sanford Underground Research Lab. And by the end of the day, I was blown away. I think I need to give you some background on this too, because you've heard a little bit. But the Sanford Underground Research Lab is the home of the former Homestead Gold Mine. And it closed in 2002. In its time, it, it extracted 41 million ounces of gold over 126 years. So yeah, some of you are like, OK, that's something. It is. It's something. Um, and in 2006, it became a dedicated science facility. The state of South Dakota invested, as did T. Denny Sanford, that's thus the name. And this place that had, as you know, a history, thanks to Ray Davis in physics, now had a future. The artwork that I made as a result of my experience of visiting one time <laughs> with a group of artists, which by the way, a group of 20 artists hanging out with physicists underground is something to watch. Um, it, was, it was definitely something, and I'm an academic, so I felt like I was kind of in between. I felt very at home in both places. I was running over to a physicist going, well, why does it do that? Very gleefully. Um, but I was so enamored, and you're, you're gonna catch on pretty quickly. I'm, I like storytelling. So I really liked the story of the search. So that's why I had a bullseye. Pink is used quite a bit at the time with the Lux experiment, which predates LZ. Um, so I also liked the architectural elements with wires and cables. And I take some time. <laughs> it takes me a while. <laughs> I started to think about how much fun I had at the Sanford lab and I started to look for other opportunities. So Fermilab, CERN, some of you might know Bell Labs has had artists you know, hang about. Um, and I thought, wow, that'd be great. I just wanna go talk to people and get inspired. And I approached the Sanford Lab, because it finally hit me, like, I wanna go back there. I've been making work about the Black Hills. I wanted to get to know my home better. And so I went and approached them and they said, sure. I said, well, can we, can we plan for like a year from now? They're like, can you start right now? It's like, okay. Um, but I, I didn't know a lot. I'd only been underground once. Remember, that was reluctant. So I had to learn quite a bit about if I'm going to spend a year plus hanging around this place, I, had to, I was committed to learning about surf. So the reason I have eyeballs on the screen, I like to say this just because I think it's funny, I wanted to gather everything related to the experience. So when I went to my eye doctor for safety glasses, I said, can I please have a picture of my eyeballs? And my doctor knows me already, but he was still like, no, I'm not, I'm not giving you a picture of your eyeballs. And I said, please. Weeks later, I get like folded up and kind of matted regular printer paper printout of this in the mail. Like it's almost like he thought about it and decided, okay, I'll send it to her secretly. Um, so there it is. Um, safety is an emphasis, which it has to be, right? It's a hundred plus year old space. They've done quite a bit to update it, but we still have to be careful when it comes to how we physically interact in the space. So, you know, safety shoes, hard hat, etc. cetera. Um, the brass tags right there, I thought it was so cool when my name was one of those. One is in your pocket and one is on a board above ground. I'll let you figure out why. And then, I'm kind of a book person, and I need to read and study before I start something. So before I started going underground the second time, I started to really dive deep. And yes, the ABCs of particle physics was a necessary purchase. Um, thanks to Fermilab for printing that. Um, and I read some of the simpler books, you know, that were made for a general audience, so they get a sense of wonder. I did find graphic novels, which blew my mind, which I'm much more comfortable with. Um, I teach graphic design, as you know, and I've taught classes that cover graphic novels, so I felt very at home there. And then I had to dive into the history of Homestake. Now that was something that was challenging on many levels, as you can imagine. 
And then that relates also to the Native American community that it, the Black Hills are sacred. So I had to really try to figure out how would I be respectful as an artist, as someone who is in a space that has had so many different functions for different people. Now the head frame image, there are two of these head frames above ground when you're in Leeds, South Dakota. And even if you're driving in town, you can catch them every once in a while. And I ended up using the head frame as a symbol, which you'll see. But this is a part of the pulley system that's kind of the hoist that allows people to go in, uh, uh, in these spaces that are a mile underground. The cage, which right there, there's a picture on the right-hand side of the cage, is an experience. If you go to the museum, you will see a video of a cage ride. I would strongly suggest you take the time to watch the entire approximately 12 minutes that it takes to get from the surface of the earth to a mile underground. And I liked the juxtaposition of technology alongside this, this cage. So you've got the board where every single person, there's a trip action plan, everybody has a purpose. And I really enjoyed that my name was up there. And underground, you'll see spaces where infrastructure is emphasized. So there's an entire group of people at SURF that are making sure it's safe, whether it's, hey, the walls need to stay up. It's kind of important. Um, and then also machinery that maybe you don't, you're not used to seeing when you're above ground. I thought he looked a little bit like Wally, and I was very delighted. He was not small, though. Um, and of course, I personified him as one would do when they're gleefully underground and all the dirt and everything. Now, there are clean spaces as well. And I was overjoyed when I crawled down. I was always with a guide when I was the artist in residence. I was overjoyed when I crawled down this ladder and then saw a chair with a ladder. I was like, oh, my little symbol sets. And I actually had this moment of thinking, wow, I belong here. Now, I'm sure you get this experience. If you're kind of attached to something, whether it's your car, you see everybody who has the same car, right? It's the same thing. I look for ladders, I look for doorways, I look for windows, there are colors that grab my attention. I don't know an artist who doesn't do that. I had the opportunity to crawl through that hole into the wonderful space where you see Dr. Penning there, and that's LZ. So I had no idea. You know, when you're going through something, you're just, I'm underground this day, I got to interact with some folks. Wow, I took some notes, this is amazing. I didn't know that, you know, three years later, I'd be here. You recognize this already? I actually couldn't back up enough to see the whole array. I was in a clean room, um, and it was just a little too small. But I don't need to explain this, thank you. <laughs> There's the Myrana experiment as well at Sanford Lab, where they electroform some of the world's purest copper. I did use copper quite a bit in the artwork. And I think that that is just such a gorgeous color. Um, I was just enamored by it. So the copper with the gold was this interesting juxtaposition for me. Also, getting in a clean room suit takes more work than I thought it would. Color. So I would pick up colors as well that I would use in the artwork. I know a lot of you recognize the little blue sticky mats. That's not, you know, super innovative, but I'd love for you to think, man, somebody thought that was the best blue. And I did. I just thought it was gorgeous. And that orange as well. Safety colors are great. And then I was in the BHSU underground campus where there's low background counting that's being done. So they test pieces so that we know that they're radioactively pure enough to be in experiments. So copper shielding and then mylar, very reflective, which I was looking at it texturally and for color. Copper gaskets from LZ. So I used a lot of copper gaskets uh, in the artwork, but I also just found them to be gorgeous, the way they catch light. <laughs> On the right-hand side is a bucket of cable slices, and one of the things I like to share about this bucket of cable slices is that one of the physicists, I was sharing with them that I thought, I kept thinking about celestial bodies, round forms, circles, and he said, well, have you ever seen cable slices? And I was like, no, no, I haven't. I mean, not like, so I went up to the lab to pick up a very dirty bucket that said, do it best on the side. And I was holding it, and I passed by the lab director, Dr. Mike Headley, or uh, Mr. Mike Headley, and I was gleeful, and I went, look. And uh, he looked at me like, okay, that's good. 
Um, glad you're happy about that. Glad we're treating you well. <laughs> Another thing that happened, which was very unexpected and just the right timing, I was underground, uh, this area called the X, which is kind of close to where you would get on the cage to go up or down. And I look over, and we're all in PPE, so it's pretty hard to see and tell what's going on for the most part. But I look over, and one of my colleagues, Dr. David Bergman, is there. And he looks at me, he said, Gina. And I said, hi, Dr. Bergman. And he said, what are you doing here? Which is a pretty reasonable question. It's not like we're at Safeway. Um, and I said, well, I'm, I'm an artist. I'm doing the artist in residence here. I'm, I'm the first one to do it. I pitched it. And he was like, oh. I said, well, what are you doing here? He goes, well, I'm just collecting bacteria, and he motions over to a bag on the ground. And I said, oh, oh, and this is before COVID, so I was like, is it dangerous? And he goes, oh, no, no, no. I said, what does it look like? And that started a wonderful relationship where I'd go to the lab and we would chat about bacteria. And so there's artwork, images in the artwork of bacteria from a mile underground, which matters greatly to me. And I did some sketching, and part of the reason I show a sketch is just so that you understand a little bit about process. I may not include the sketches as a part of the finalized artwork, but it's how I can quickly work through ideas. You could see a ladder, you could see a bullseye, you could see the head frame. I'm trying to figure out how to express what dark matter looks like. Would it be spidery webs of something? You know, what's the cosmic microwave background look like? You know, so I had a, a pretty good time thinking about those things. And then I'll just talk about a few of the pieces, hopefully enough to entice you to walk a very short distance over to the museum. So this piece is called Just Above the Surface. And I wanted, I don't know how to express how dreamy it felt to be surrounded by so much hope. I think that's the thing about physicists is we're often looking to the future with some positive outlook, right? It's like hopeful. So it was hard not to grab onto that and be like, yes. Um, so it just felt very hopeful. I used quite a bit of Hubble imagery, um, and I always joke, that's your tax dollars at work, thank you, and myself too. Um, but I think it's an excellent use of our tax dollars when we are actually trying to figure out what's going on out there, since we know so little. So I took this picture in the daytime, which I only say because people are usually like, what? But I think it makes you look at it differently and you figure out that I've manipulated a little bit. But I like that dreamy, painterly landscape. Dr. Ray Davis, you might recognize him from this image and also when Dr. Penning was there with that image with him. So I won't go into the physics, but I found him to be inspiring as a person. The idea of approaching the Homestake Company, which you saw was digging, digging up quite a bit of gold and ore and saying, hey, I just wanna go down there at the same time as all, all these miners and I'm gonna build this thing and we're gonna look for neutrinos. So he and Davis Bac or, uh, Bacall had built this experiment and I just imagine it was delightful to interact with him at that time. Some of the artwork I made, I was trying really hard to talk about the biggest things and the smallest things at the same time or at least how they seem related to me intellectually or visually. On the left hand side you see the gold gold pan which took more work than it should have. My, HOA, I'm sure, was not happy with how many times I was out in the yard spray painting gold onto various objects or copper. Um, learned which plastic worked with that plastic. So inside of that gold pan, you see a Google Earth image of Leeds, South Dakota. And then on the right-hand side, you see an image of what is a core sample. It is an image, a scan. One of the things that Sanford Lab does is we make sure that we don't take any of the land or the rock out of the Black Hills. So I also wanted to pay respect to that and make sure that this was a printed material so that I was not doing that either. Now, the complexity of gold mining as symbol. There's something of, that's kind of interesting about a place where people went to make a living, et cetera, et cetera. But I kept thinking about it as symbol of searching, looking for something, digging something up. So I found that interesting when you think about what the science is doing now. And then there are those copper gaskets. That's a piece of wood, wood from the Sanford lab that I think it's a gasket. Everything came from places. The little miner came from a little tiny place in South Dakota as well in the Black Hills. Some of that bacteria, I just kept thinking like, how do you talk about dark matter? How do you talk about this? How do you talk about that? 
Um, so when I think about the abstract parts of the cosmos, I do find it comforting to use some of these really small things because I do think they're probably similar somehow. I just, in my mind, they sound similar. We see repeated patterns all the time, whether it's in trees or fingerprints or whatever it is. We just see patterns. So I thought this was interesting because I really wanted to use home stake, quotes around that, blueprints. So this is a 1933 blueprint of one of the head frames. So I was like, yeah, I'm digging that. And then of course I put it with, you know, contemporary, like my arrow, obviously a graphic, and then a manipulation of the bacteria. More bacteria, I really liked it. I kept thinking about noise. I kept thinking about how do you get through the noise? I kept thinking about the big bang. What happens to energy? And energy became a topic that I still think I'm gonna wrestle with in artwork, um, especially in a singular image. I'm sure at some point I'm gonna end up doing video and other stuff. I've kind of been tooling around with it. But when I think about how this started, it's hard to figure out an image to describe that. So on the right-hand side, I kept trying to work on the Big Bang. That's actually some photo manipulation from some, some of the um, reflected mylar that I, I found. And then I kept thinking about celestial bodies, more bacteria, more Hubble. That's a burst disk on the right-hand side. So if you don't know what a burst disk is, it's about the size of my fist. And I'm sure people are very sad when it's spent, but I was not sad when it was spent because first of all, it did its job. And second of all, it became artwork. So I scanned it on a flatbed scanner. I did take a flatbed scanner uh, below ground, a mile below ground. When, at first, when I started working there, I was told, we can't give you any of these things. Go underground, scan them if you want. And I spent most of a day just putting rings or copper gaskets and the occasional sterling gasket onto a flatbed scanner over and over and over and over again. I have a lot of images if anybody wants to know. <laughs> And two of the pieces that were kind of a struggle to actually resolve, I kept using wood from the lab because I kept thinking, man, if I could get rings of the tree, kind of like echoing the celestial bodies, echoing the copper gaskets, but I just couldn't get the physical wood to work. So I had a deadline. I think I had two weeks before an opening and I started panic scanning because the scanner was that crutch all of a sudden because I knew I probably could push something out. And I thought, well, you know, at least then I could use those colors that I like that are the safety colors. So it did work out. I was glad that I finally got desperate. On the left-hand side, the search, that's the piece, I've manipulated it now a little further. That's the piece I did when I got to Sanford Lab the first time. You know, my reluctant visit. So glad that sometimes we have to do things we're not sure about. And I revisited that 10 years later, whatever it's been, and manipulated it further, thinking of fire and water, thinking about these elements, because I thought that would be fun. And uh, kind of a, it's kind of interesting as an artist to be able to go back through your ar archive. It's one of those things that I know a lot of us keep canvases and paper and stacks of things, and we revisit it. So I did this digitally. I revisited these. The ladder and the head frame together, so I told you that reaching is kind of my symbol with the ladder. And then the head frame I thought was nice juxtaposed with that. And then those cable slices actually turned out okay. So I scanned them on that flatbed scanner and they took many forms. Um, so I started in 2019 and I kept saying summer of 2020 was my, my summer. I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have said that, <laughs> right? I'm sure many people say that, but I'm kind of, it's interesting how things turn out, again, when your plans change and you have to innovate. So what happened is I had, this piece was a large rose window style piece to begin with, and it was okay as a rose window. I mean, it was, people were like, oh, that's really pretty. It reminds me, it's a rose window. And I had been pretty isolated, and I thought, man, I just miss people. And I thought, touch. I thought, what's more human? Like, if you think about man in a cave and knowing that he was there or they were there, 
I was trying to think about how do I talk about humanity? So the first version of this was about a foot wide, and I was like, no, 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 it needs to be bigger. So the one that's in the gallery is about four feet wide, because that was the limit that the print shop had, which I'm thankful for after shipping it here. So I would love for you to go see the exhibition. It is just up the road, and I, I have to say um, some really clear thank yous. Um, the museum has been wonderful to work with this week. I mean, they've been wonderful to work with for over a year, almost a year and a half. It's been that long, hasn't it? And they've, they've just been excellent. I've, I've been treated so well. I appreciate the physics, um, UM physics here, specifically Dr. Bjorn Penning for making this happen. The Stanford Underground Research Facility, I mean, without them, we, we, we might not be here at all. <laughs> um, and then Black Hill State University for always being supportive of these ideas that I keep coming up with. So, thank you. Okay, wonderful, wonderful. Wow, that was unique and interesting. Uh, we will um, take some time for questions. You, you'd be willing to answer some questions. Um, we are going to uh, circulate microphones. We want to make sure that when you have your question, you get to ask it with a microphone so that it gets uh, broadcast and on tape. Um, there's a second microphone here, and my colleague, Professor Clark, Excellent. we'll take this side of the room. And I've been wondering how we should go about this, whether we should um, separately ask questions of Bjorn and, and Gina, oh, it's up to you, or we'll just take them as they come. Okay, great. All right, who has a question? Here's one. Well, before that, Here. can... Well, Doug, I uh, have a question for both Mr. Bennett and uh, Gina. So if somebody can bring that image of the cloud chamber so I can address the question with the cloud chamber. image of a cloud can chamber. Can you put the cloud chamber back? I think um, everybody image, might have the same question about what it is. If, and that's actually the question related with Gina. Your philosophy agree with the second part, with the meaning of any art. And therefore, if we don't understand what it is, there's no meaning, so my question is irrelevant. So I actually question before that image come up is what it is. I never see the cloud chamber. I never see personally alpha, beta, gamma, this uh, what, So images. what you see here? Maybe you can slow down a little bit. OK, let, let me be brief on that because I think I don't want to go into detail. What you're seeing here is particles ionize um, the vapor. In these, ion these ionized atoms, they create n like the nucleus of little clouds. And you see the track going through it, right? Yeah, that's what you see. And this is just what happens around us all the time. In fact, this process is important to the creation of, of clouds uh, in the atmosphere. And it's in some sense also how your eye works in the in a distant sense of via ionization and signals. Okay, but yeah. That is to the left. And this to the left is just the source. This is a weld this is a welding rod. Because welding welding rods contain thorium and thorium is an alpha emitter. Source, yes. Well then the question is, can you convert that complicated thing into artistic ways, then the meaning I could try. <laughs> the answer is always, I'll, I'll try. I think sometimes, I, okay, so a part of the artistic process, and Dr. Penning can say this, I would make something without understanding what I was doing, and I would send him an image, and I'd say, this is how I felt. And he'd say, oh, are you thinking about this? And I had two or three friends that are, I have a friend who's a mathematician who also moonlights as a physicist. <laughs> Shouldn't I say that? I should give him a shout out. Um, no, he, he's, every, he's an everything man. Um, so I have a couple of people in my life that I can easily have chit chat about, okay, I have this wild idea. So 
if I find that somebody will look at me and entertain my wild idea, I'll sit with somebody for hours and say, well, what do you think this looks like? How do you think this behaves? So how does this make me feel? Which is a whole different thing because as an artist, most of the time I'm in here and then it has to kind of go back and forth between my brain and my heart. So I don't know how it all gets distilled. It might be as mysterious as a, you know, <laughs> cloud chamber. Thank you. Professor Clark. Yeah, thanks for that one wonderful uh, connection there. So um, could you say something about the connection to indigenous culture in this region as, as tribal lands and uh, the, the work is being done uh, underneath those lands? So how does your interpretation and work as an artist connect to indigenous culture? That's my question. I tried to be very intentional about making sure I didn't tell a story that wasn't mine. Um, so, and that's just how I feel personally, as a, especially as an academic. I always go back to that because I, I think that someone might say I overthink and agonize. I might, have, I might do that just a touch. Um, I was very concerned about unintentionally making a statement or using a symbol or referencing something unintentionally. So I did try to dive into, um, I have some experience now with local native organizations that are arts related. I do have open conversations with folks about, you know, what are you making? What does that mean? What's this symbol? So I, I think I'm just trying to make sure that I'm talking from my own authentic place, which is my own unique, you know, there's probably enough going on in here. <laughs> yeah. But thank you. Thank you. Hi, I have a question for Gina. Um, I'm kind of wondering how did you stumble into your career as someone who has a toe per se in both the academic community and in the artistic community? And also, do you have any advice or wisdom for someone who's coming from an academic setting and trying to branch kind of similar, like cross the bridge um, and connect with the artistic realm, but through academics? I love that question. Okay, so I love undergrads and graduate students. Um, so I, I didn't wanna quit learning, so I think becoming a teacher was the next, you know, I was like, I just don't wanna quit going to school, but an MFA is a terminal degree. I mean, yes, you can get doctoral programs, but for the most part, if you're a maker, that's the terminal degree. So I kind of went, well, I guess, I guess I'm gonna have to teach. <laughs> and I had a professor, Dr. John Labity, shout out to him, um, who is my mentor, who he and Margie Labity have been really good guides. So I would say finding people who do the things that you think they're doing it well, ask them questions, don't be shy. I mean, I had mentorship and I applied to every job on earth, it felt like in 2007 and 2008. And then just on a whim, went out to the Black Hills of South Dakota because Margie Labity said, oh, it's beautiful out there, you should at least go check it out. So again, just like going underground, I was kind of like, I don't know. That's pretty far away from North Carolina. So I would say take chances. You just never know. The thing that you're avoiding could be the thing that actually you can dig deep and, and figure out stuff about yourself and your art and yeah. Thank you. All right, a technical question. Bjorn, uh, why Xenon? Oh yeah, very good question. So Xenon is a noble gas, and it's the heaviest noble gas that is not radioactive. And the heavier it is, the better of a dark matter part, uh, target it is for dark matter that we think is connected to, you know, what we call the electroweak scales where the Higgs boson lives. The other thing is that Xenon, being so heavy, if I would have here a pot of xenon, first I would be rich. Second, I could put a piece of aluminum in there, it would swim on it. So it's as dense as a metal. So it has an, yet it's transparent to its own light. This is why you have in a fancy car xenon headlights. So it's an excellent target, but it's self-shielding because most radiation is not able to penetrate deep into it, except of things like neutrons and dark matter. And then it produces this light, and it, this, this specific light is able to come out, and we can detect it. Yeah. 
Hi, uh, good morning. Thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I, I was just really blown away by the scales that you've presented, you know, the size of, uh, and just thinking about um, that dark, dark, uh, dark matter is just maybe just a small amount. I mean, physically, I think you gave us that image of, of a Death Star, for example, as symbol symbolizing all of dark matter uh, in the universe. Um, how how is that sort of scale estimated? And if it's so dilute, for example, in the entire space, what's the probability that you'll be able to detect it? Yeah. Just so this is a very very good question. Excellent question. So first, how do we know this? So this pie chart with the numbers is something we know to the percent level precision. These ripples in the early universe and the cosmic microwave background, which is presented in several of the uh, pieces that you can see, this is an imprint of the last scatter after the Big Bang. You can imagine it like, you know, Michigan, snow, you look out, oh, it snowed, great, right? And you see like the bunnies and the deers running through it. It's absolutely certain. So this, so this is how we measure it primarily. There are other ways which are, have less, are less accurate, but give us the same number very independently. So we're absolutely certain. Now, the probability, yes, this is a good question. <laughs> What's the probability we find it? Our former spokesperson said in the, in the presentation, it's more than five and less than 50%. I want to leave it there, right? We can do our best. We hope nature is kind to us. But we don't, if, if I would know where it is, we would have an easier life. Right. Here's a question. Yeah, I'm sorry, I must have missed something. What gallery are you at? Oh, it's at the, um, that's a very good question, actually. Um, I'll, I'll go back to the picture just so you have a little visual. It's at the Natural History Museum in their experimental gallery. Just walk down there 200 meters. It's on their first floor. Yeah. Um, my question relates to the previous question. If this dark matter is so hard to spot, so rare, there's so many interfering components, how will you know you've found it? This is an excellent question. So. I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Arthur Conan Doyle, Sherlock Holmes, who says, when you exclude all possibilities, then whatever remains must be the truth. And I wasn't going into all those details, but for example, this giant outer detector that we built is part of, if we see something, we're building our experiment background free, so whatever remains must be dark matter. And this is something we didn't know before, right? We could discover something else. This is why we built this crucial outer detector that is able to, for example, prove it's not an uh, unexpected neutron flux. But at the end of the day, if we discover it, then certainly we're all getting ready to like booking our tickets to Stockholm, but some other experiment will have to confirm it, right? We need confirmation, independent confirmation, but we have to start somewhere, yes. Any more hands here? Here's one, one down here. Oh, great. Or maybe I can just... Yeah. Um, a number of years ago, there was a gentleman that came here, Samuel Ting. Yeah. Um, and they launched a dark matter yeah, detector. Yes. Did anything ever happen with that, or is there any... So, yeah, Sam Ting uh, was an undergrad here, Nobel Prize laureate uh, professor at uh, MIT. Um, the AMS experiment is essentially a flying particle detector on the ISS. And the, the different ways to look for dark matter. We are looking for dark matter in space, and he's looking for dark matter in space via annihilation in where, where we expect much of it. And actually, the experiment sees some interesting excesses in antiproton and positron, so anti-electrons, antimatter, that might or might not be dark matter. It's one of the things which is kind of interesting, but we're digging deeper. It's, it's difficult, yes. Okay, uh, here's a question. A oh, question for uh, Professor Gibson. I was curious about, you mentioned you had an exhibit in Fermilab, and I was curious if there's anything different there in terms of the experiments and setup there. What are your thoughts? Oh, that's helpful. Um, so the Fermilab exhibit was virtual. I was their last virtual show. Um, <laughs> uh, I had a chance to visit Fermilab while I was the artist in residence at SURF. 
uh, Fermi Labs Artists in Residence program is about six years older than the Sanford Labs Artists in Residence program. And I went there in part to learn about their program because I told the Sanford Lab I would kind of be the, you know, I, I would be their experiment in what it means to have an artist in residence. Uh, so I went to Fermi Lab. I had talks with their arts programming director, who was delightful. Um, and then that seed was planted for, I want to have a show here. Um, so I did approach them after the work was finished at SURF. At least I thought it was finished, and then I made more, um, which is how it works. So I did a virtual exhibition with them that closed out. I did a talk, very similar. Um, and then when I started planning this exhibition, I made more work because of the size of the gallery, which is a great problem to have. But I received all these documents showing the space, and I went, man, I just gotta, I gotta make some more work. So what a great excuse, right? Like, and I'm very good at being pressured by deadlines. So I, I will make stuff forever and just kind of mill about if I'm not careful. So I was very grateful for that deadline, so. Hi, my question is partly pertaining to how you incorporate undergrad and grad students into doing something like this where there is an artist that is working with physicists or mathematicians or whatever. Um, how are they helping in coordination with you creating the art and also how are they helping you in the physics? I have to be honest, um, I kind of tend to be a one woman band. Um, my undergrads, so I'm at a teaching institution. We have a BFA program, but we don't have an MFA. We don't have an MA program yet. We're working on that. Um, so I have, the inclusion is I share with my students process issues. So I tend to tell them like, hey, when you call Simpsons Printing, make sure it doesn't chip because of this, because I just broke that thing. So there's a tendency toward I'm in conversation with them and I might use it as, I might learn something by doing and then take it into my class, but they're not directly involved at this point. I even packed and shipped the work myself, which we kept joking about. He's like, what are you doing? Um, some of that's just habit, I, you know, just kind of do stuff. So yeah, I, I have been thinking of ways to get students involved at the lab though. That is something that is definitely in the back of my mind. Like what would it look like if we had a uh, undergraduate version of an artist in residence program or yeah so we it's definitely something I'm thinking about it might take me five to six years that's generally how long it takes me to figure something out <laughs> so for me it's very much the opposite if there wouldn't be undergrad students grad students and postdocs research would come to a grinding halt um, undergrads I usually try to work to, with two to three undergrads and have some chance to really focus on them over several years, maybe from you know first, second year to the final year. At the beginning, you put more work in them than you get out of them, of course, but it's also our, our, our job to educate them. And if they're good, they're great. I have like this fantastic undergrad who uh, this summer goes the second time out for three months and really helps making the science stronger. Georgia, so in case Georgia listens. And I saw earlier here uh, Ayla Rodriguez, I think she left by now, who is an undergrad I met sort of in proxy from Black Hill. She's an outstanding student, did fantastic work, and I've just realized she's really smart, and so actually, via, via my wife, who's a professor here too, we attracted her, and then she got this prestigious fellowship as now a grad student. So undergrads are work, but it's our job. So, so and, and they're great. It takes some time, but they're great. Now, grad students, of course, they come a bit more, more mature, still need work the first one or two years, but when they're done, like Chami over there, um, or almost done, <laughs> they are the world experts, right? They are the world experts, and we need them, same with postdocs. I have a, a slightly philosophical question. <clears throat> um, I'm interested in the mindset of people who work deep underground. And um, I'm reminded of, of the great classic by Thomas Mann, Magic Mountain, who described the protagonist of that story, uh, described 
how lucid his thoughts were when he was on top of the mountain and um, how when he descended onto the plains below, that kind of went away uh, by extension. Uh, do you have any thoughts about how your mind works or uh, how your thoughts are changed by working at 5,000 feet below the surface of the earth? So, the novel you're referring to, that Zauberberg in German. Um, I think, you know, when I, you know, I, I used to work at CERN, I used to work at the Tevatron, now underground. I think when you're a researcher and you're at a research facility, it focuses your mind. Um, really focuses your mind. I don't think the thinking is more lucid or not. Uh, you're just in the lab and you do things you have no other chance to do. The one thought creeping up about all four hours, which is unique underground, is I'm hungry. Because you're, for some reason, getting very hungry underground, like enough that people make studies about it. <laughs> it's really funny he said that, because I'm almost in the exact same, definitely in the same boat for hunger. I, I, I'm like, I have almonds in my pockets kind of situation. Um, but I think the same thing, it, it brings focus. I mean, when I, and I think part of that is, so there's a trip action plan or a tap. I think every step makes you focus about your, your purpose for being there that day. So I've always got an agenda. And if that agenda isn't met, then I've wasted, first of all, I've wasted the, the lab's money or somebody's time because I have a guide. Um, and now I'm a guide partially for, for the artist in residence program. So when I'm with an artist, I'm always like, I'm watching them do the same thing I'm doing. They're focused. So, yeah. Right. Thanks. Thank you. Just a little correction. It's over 5,200 feet below. Hi, uh, this is for Gina and for and for Bjorn. I was wondering if um, um, what sample of responses you got from physicists and Bjorn from like the art world, and if you could talk a bit about the connections you hope to make between these two spheres and the connections that you did observe and making. I have to think about that. Um, I have found in some ways, communicating with physicists, engineers, I think there's mutual respect for profession. I think that's been recognized. So I think it's kind of like, oh, you're the expert at this thing. You're someone that I could talk to about what you do. I think the seriousness of that is, as the playing field has been very, I mean, it's been there since day one from the first time I went underground in 2013. Um, I told you there were 20 funny, I mean, it was a funny, I almost wish I had a video of the first time 20 artists are underground with physicists and everybody's trying to have a conversation. Um, what does dark matter look like? And it's like, well, we're trying to figure that out. It's like, well, we need to know what it looks like. We're making art about it. It's like, well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, so it was really fun. I mean, I had a great time listening to people. So I think every part of the conversation is interesting from the, I'm trying to figure out how to start this idea to the execution, to this thing, whether it's on a wall or it's a video or whatever the art is, however it manifests. So, and I think I've had a, I've had a great time. The last week's been awesome. So, <laughs> if that's anything, it's been great. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, I wouldn't have much to add, right? I mean, at some day, at some point, I walked into the surface lab in a clean room, and there was this lady with these very loud glasses, and I was like, that's not a physicist. She had the same glasses in bright red. And then I saw the art develop. I mean, I, the, the flatbed story, I was sitting next to, the, next to her and was like, what, what the hell, what is she doing? You know, I was like working and she's like, and I just saw it develop, it was beautiful. And the moment I saw the final objects, just before the pandemic, I was like, this is fantastic. And then I came to Michigan in the middle of the pandemic and I saw the opportunities and we're not living in a vacuum. What we're doing is not in a vacuum. And you, Michigan has this amazing facility. So I was like, just bring it here. I applied for a grant. I didn't get a grant, of course. And, um, and we made it happen anyway. That's what we do, right? We made things happen, and they're nice, right? Yeah. And we're among the beneficiaries, for sure. <clears throat> um, well, there, I have a, a list of questions here. So sure. I'm going to try to um, put a question that will work for both of you uh, in turn. Uh, so starting with Bjorn, though. Um, 
So your experiment's looking for particles, you know, really small things that are interacting with your detector. What other potential explanations for dark, well, the, the graph you showed us um, where the uh, motion of stars isn't right if there's no dark matter? What other explanations are there? I love this question. So once in a while you go on Twitter because Twitter is the source of all truth or you go some some web page that masquerades as a news web page that just ag aggregates Twitter, right? <laughs> and that tells you, no, we have something else. We don't have dark matter. Dark matter is disproven because someone took one formal, one object of the, the many, many proofs and handcrafts a formula and matches the data handcrafted without other, any other motivation than matching this observation says dark matter is excluded. This is not true. Dark matter is as sure as I'm standing here. It doesn't mean that we know much about it. What we're looking for, I mentioned, is electroweak type of dark matter. I'm also developing an experiment using superfluid helium to look for dark matter at much lower energies. And at the very lowest could be axion type dark matter, like a type of dark photon, like a, like a sort of new force mediated by a photon masses type particle. Uh, and in a, with mixing, a very complicated, can, can, can have an effect. So dark matter exists. But the type of dark matter is something we're very actively working on. And it could be more like a wave, a field going through the universe at very light masses. It could also be, in the extreme case, like a bunch of supermassive black holes floating around and gobbling up, which all of those things are extreme cases. And we're going for the most likely one. Coming back to Sherlock Holmes, we're looking for the most likely one. But maybe we know in two years what it is. Maybe we know in 200 years what it is. Sorry. And then I wonder, in, maybe in response to that, Gina, so there are other things, that not just the very smallest things, but physicists sometimes seem to be reductionist, always trying to get to the smallest piece. How do you, as an artist, feel about reductionism, small things? I like thinking about big and small, and I like putting them together. So, because I don't think there's that big of a difference. I, I think most of the time things are very similar. I mean, we're all made of the same stuff. Um, so I often think, well, how is that any, how, I mean, yes, this is different. I'm not a table, but, you know, there's something about it. So I think abstractly, I like thinking about how it's all connected without getting overly, you know, it's all interconnected. But in some way, I really do think that way. So I don't think big or little. I think, well, maybe that bacteria does represent pretty well whatever the cosmic web is. Or maybe they actually do have a similar pattern. So that's how I think about it. <clears throat> um, there's another question about um, two-dimensional art and three-dimensional art, and um, I don't know exactly uh, what is more meaningful, maybe that's not a great question, but um, how are they different and what can you achieve in one way that you can't in the other and vice versa? I've often said I'm kind of indifferent, <laughs> I mean that sounds funny, indifferent is, well, I make based on what I feel like making right that minute. I had a body of work that was all the found object work. Um, I did find it was easier to show kind of the more abstract symbolic imagery through digitally manipulated images. I found that easier to figure out how to get what's in here out. Uh, but I like objects as objects because then I think they, people get attached to an object. They understand, okay, she picked up a rock. Why is this rock here? Why did she stick something inside that rock? Why is it poking out? Like, I like that somebody can really understand that. Whereas a digitally manipulated image or something I've put on the wall, somebody might have to just stand there and go, I don't know, but she used some nice colors. You know? <laughs> so I think it's a different experience for the viewer. So I wouldn't give value to either. I think it's, I just kind of felt like doing it that way each time, or intellectually felt like I needed to go that direction. Great, well, are there any more questions? Oh, great. Well, actually, it would help for our um, recording. Thank you. Um, I think the connection between just what you're both doing is a process, right? And I, I'm more on the artist side of things. And so for me, doing things with my hands is much more than two-dimensional. But for me, it's like the, the process for me is what I love. Like, and like you're going through the process of investigating and you love the science and the ideas and what may come of it and what you might learn from it, not necessarily. I mean, you want that resolved. 
but like I think I think there would be a level of disappointment if the result came really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It's just that, you know what I mean? It's like the exploring is the yeah. ideas, and I feel like that's the connection between making and art and science. It's like you learn so much from the start to the finish. So if something was the end, I'm like, yeah, it's nice, and I I like that I made this, but really the whole process of it was what was really exciting for me, mm-hmm. and that's what I feel like the connection sometimes between. Yeah, no, indeed, and also the creativity, because the things that you're building are unique, and they require create creative solutions. And in and the moment you switch it on, something is completely different because a new realm, and you have to think about it. I think the curiosity and creativity is common to yeah. both, yeah. Deep, right. deeply the same. Yeah, I totally agree with. That. I I mentioned curiosity as being my first point because. I definitely felt like, I mean, and I would like to say this so it's recorded for all eternity. Part of the reason that we all got along so well is we would meet and sing karaoke together. So that was, I mean, if you're willing to embarrass yourself, which I have found has been very useful as a tool to making friends, um, that has been, I think that we, you know, you sit down, you have a conversation with somebody, you sing a song together. Suddenly, it's different when you run into each other underground or above ground, so... There you go. It's all, for all eternity, people will know. There are recordings out there. <laughs> That's probably a great note to finish on. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, well, thank, thank you, you so much. It was just fascinating uh, to see the collaboration and your work, both of your works. And uh, thanks for all the great questions. And we have two more Saturday morning physics um, presentations. Uh, next week uh, is the Van Lu presentation, which are uh, presentations by graduate students uh, in the physics and astronomy department. And then the week after that is the Walker lecture, which is a visitor uh, who will be talking about quantum sensors. So we hope to see you then. Bye, everybody. <laughs>